Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. It's been a little bit of a stressful morning, but I feel joyful and even cheerful in this moment, which is really quite miraculous today. So, today, um, I would like to start with um, an opening of the physical uh, being with your sense of smell through the air. Smell and sight and sound. It, it's such a beautiful spring day out here today, but whatever kind of a day it is for our, for our physical opening today, I'd like to begin with just, just um, putting on any kind of an essential oil. I started with geranium this morning. But putting on some kind of an essential oil, some kind of calm music, and looking at some beautiful artwork, and just experience that. Just experience the, the sense of, of wonder that comes in your soul when you recognize that that we have such miraculous things as sight and hearing and smell that that can lift us and change us and and those things are some of the things by which we experience our world and they're good they're very good and as you experience that smell those sights, those sounds, those feelings. Allow your mind to wander back to some beautiful smells that you remember. Uh, smell is a great uh, trigger for the memory. So think back to things you've smelled in the past that you loved. The smell of baking bread always comes to my mind. Um, I love the smell of diesel fuel because it reminds me of um, when my husband and I first met, we were um, in the band together and we took several bus trips together. And so the smell of diesel fuel from a bus always reminds me of that and makes me feel um, that memory and that joy. Uh, let's see, the smell of fruit makes me think of spring or even autumn. Uh, I love the smell of blossoms. I encourage you to go out and find a tree that has blossoms and go and just stand under it downwind and smell that smell and the refreshing uh, feeling that it gives you because that's what they are for. Uh, there's a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that talks about that. Um, for taste and for smell and for touch, come on in. It's it's a it's a beautiful scripture that that reminds me that that God loves us in all those ways. He says, "Yea, and the herb and the good things which come of the earth." This is Doctrine and Covenants 59, verse 17. Whether for food or for raiment, or for houses or for barns, or for orchards or for gardens or for vineyards. Yea, all things which come of the earth, in the season thereof, are made for the benefit and use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart. Yea, for food, for raiment, for taste, for smell, to strengthen the body, and to enliven the soul. And that's where, what we're about here, is enlivening the soul, to bring life back into the soul. <sighs> And so, with that beginning opening of the soul to the smells and sights and sounds of our world that are beautiful, um, I'd like to bring in our stone today, which is a beautiful blue lapis lazuli. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Pronounce it. It's a bright, bright blue stone. 
Lapis Lazuli. L A P I Z is how it's spelled. Lapis Lazuli. It's a beautiful stone that is. It, it's full of deepness, and and that deepness is is a, a wonderful healer. It's um, it's enough to lower your blood pressure. It um, boosts the immune system. It uh, is helpful if you're feeling sluggish, low, or just out of whack with life. It's good for depression, insomnia, vertigo. Um, it uh, soothes inflammation and fights um, for the health of the respiratory and nervous systems. It's also good for unblocking the throat and the thyroid. Um, if you suffer from sore throats, vocal cord issues, or organ complaints, this stone works to flush the system and keep you thriving. It also is good to remind you of your own self-worth and to help you to recognize and realize and speak your truth. Um, it encourages self-expression and invites you to speak that truth and form bonding relationships and close-knit friendships. So lapis lazuli is a very uh, powerful stone for, for lots of things. But today especially, um, I think the focus is on, in, on its ability to help us to rise above something. So the essential oil we're going to talk about today in connection with that is juniper berry. Juniper berry is uh, is not the most pleasant of smells, in in my opinion. It's it's got sort of a bitter smell, and it's called the oil of night. And it assists those who fear the dark and unknown aspects of themselves. And who doesn't have those, right? Everybody's got dark and unknown aspects of themselves but it helps us to understand that those things that we fear are intended to be our teachers. So instead of hiding from what we don't understand, Juniper Berry encourages individuals to learn the lesson and face their fear. These fears often live within the unexplored areas of the self. Juniper Berry acts as a catalyst by helping individuals access and address those fears and issues with, which have long been avoided. Dreams contain nighttime communications. Even nightmares can reveal unresolved fears and issues. Juniper Berry offers courage and energetic protection in the nighttime. It encourages a, an honest assessment of the information being communicated from within. As individuals reconcile with their fears, and other hidden aspects of themselves, they experience greater wholeness. Juniper helps restore the balance between light and dark, conscious and subconscious, night and day. It acts as a guide on the path toward wholeness. Juniper Berry teaches that there is truly nothing to fear when one acknowledges and accepts all aspects of the self. So, that's basically our introduction to what we're going to talk about today, which is the uh, stages of grief. So who among us has not experienced grief and loss of some kind? Nobody. Life is full of it, just full, and that's an interesting concept right there, to have a fullness or an abundance of loss. <laughs> so even loss can be abundant. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because if we can recognize that there is abundance even in loss, we can learn how to pass through it. So today we're going to just talk about some of the stages of grief and grieving and loss and letting go and and what that means what that means to each of us so um, 
I don't think I have a really like a set like this is how it is but I would just like to explore some of the thoughts and feelings that come up as we talk about this. So I've got somebody here right now and we might be talking about this a bit with issues that are happening right now. Um, but it, e either way, it's going to be more of a discussion maybe than, than just a lecture. So the first um, thing that comes up when you're dealing with grief is the shock. So I, I believe that, that when, when something happens that feels like loss, that our system is shocked because it feels like it's almost like something's been torn from you, torn out of you. So for instance, if you have two people and they, they're, they're together and they like each other and they're, they're companions and they spend time together and then one is no longer there, then it can feel like you're alone. It can feel uh, very, very painful, and it feels like loss. So the, the system is instantly shocked with that, that feeling. So um, some of the emotions, what would you say are some of the emotions that you feel during that shock period? I, I think the most shockful part is recently is just like um, seeing someone be like happy they're themselves and then and then like a really quick turn to like something you don't recognize um, and kind of the shock of just seeing like that's what your body looks like at the end uh -huh. like it doesn't look anything like your, yourself and then you you start to realize like the things that like you're you're used to doing that you don't do anymore. Right. Like I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It does. It makes a lot of sense. So you're recognizing the differences, the changes. Yeah. So I think change is a big a big part of that. I was just wondering if maybe you could turn the camera if she's speaking sometimes. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so we feel confusion maybe a little discomfort, a little, you know, that, that shock factor of, oh, wow. And, you know, the body itself feels that. You can lose your appetite, maybe. Uh, feel like you just feel lost. Um, and that's, I, I, I would, I described it as broken. Like, like something, like, like we were this and now we're this and I feel broken because we're this, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's a sad and confused and broken period in general. But as that initial shock wears off, then, then it's replaced with um, an unbelievable amount of pain and sometimes even guilt, pain at, at the unbearable thought of going on without that other person or even that condition in your life because grieving isn't necessarily about death. It can be just about change, like moving to a new place or, or starting a new job or um, losing an old job or an, an old situation or losing something that you valued it, it can we can go through that with any one of those so anyway so after we've gone through that shock then then comes the pain and the and guilt and and I didn't understand this till just recently that that sometimes after after the initial shock is worn off and you're in this pain period that that you can feel actual guilt about another person being gone from you. And, and it's not like blame that you did something to cause their death, but, but there's, there's a thing called survivor guilt. Yeah. And, and they, uh, I, I first noticed this, and I didn't know what to call it, but I noticed it in my, in my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles 
mostly the aunts though, because they were left. And, and what it was is they, they, felt, they felt like, why should I be alive when they're not? Why did I get to stay here and they didn't? You know, and they feel like, oh, what's, what's wrong with, with me that, that I'm being left behind or, or something like that, you know? They felt, they felt bad that they were, were, were still here while that other person, whom they usually thought was better than they were, died, you know? So they consider it something like a judgment, and then they feel guilty that, that, that they're not dead, you know? <laughs> And, and it's, it's really just like under the surface. I don't think you like name it and go, I am so guilty. <laughs> it's more just like this, this sort of hollow feeling that, gosh, why do I deserve to live, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes the guilt of like, I should have done more, you know? Yeah. Like, if I would have known, if I would have known this would happen that fast, I would have done more things like you know you feel like you do enough until that person's not there anymore then right. it's almost like like should I have said thank you for something yeah. or should I brought them that meal or should I have said that one thing that I wanted to say to them or, yeah yeah definitely some guilt rises from that and and that guilt coupled with their loss can create a pain that's unbearable because with them gone, it's unsolvable. It seems like it's unsolvable. It seems like, well, now they're gone, I can't do it. And if you can't, then that's like, that's, that's like saying you can never be forgiven of your sin, you know? It's like, you're done, it's all over, you know? And that finality kind of gives a really painful slam to that guilt. And, and especially if you've left something undone or you feel like you did, then and the pain is is accented even more by that, yeah. by the, yeah. the finality of it. Yeah. So, and and I, we we've all experienced this. And today I'll probably be speaking mostly out of my experience, and and Donnell here will be speaking out of her experience. But but that's how we learn. And so if if there's something you've experienced, then you know, extrapolate it to your situation. Okay, so after shock and denial, I, I didn't mention denial, but shock kind of implies that you're like, no, this, no. You know? I remember when, when my best friend um, died and, and I was told it, and the first thing I said was no. You know, your mind just says, no, no, it can't be. And I remember when our bishop passed away and they told me the news and I just screamed. I just screamed, no, no, you know, and we, we, want, we want to deny it. We want to say, no, that's not possible and, and, and put it away from us. And that's, that's part of the shock. And so after that and the pain and possible guilt, then then we go into um, uh, anger and bargaining. <laughs> so in that, in that pain and guilt, when you're feeling desperate and possibly betrayed by death, like it sort of blindsided you and took you by surprise and you're like, this is so unfair, then anger can set in. And specifically, anger, in, in my case, toward God. I, I immediately thought of God because I believe in God. I believe he's there. I believe he has the power over life and death. So when he took my best friend, I was angry. I was, I was super angry and bitter and, and felt betrayed. And, and the loss was so immense in my soul that, and, and I had a ton of guilt, a ton of guilt, because we, uh, we were living so far apart, and I knew she was going down a path of, 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 you know, things that were not the best, 
and I couldn't be near her, and so I couldn't be her friend close by, so I felt so guilty. And then when God took her away, it was like, oh, just... So yeah, I was into the anger. Um, and, and then, you know, at, at some point, I suppose we want to ask God to bring them back. Bring back what was lost. Bring back that friend. Bring back that family member, that, um, that thing we lost. You know, I, I don't want to lose this. You, you have to bring it back. And I think that's part of denial as well. We just, we, we just desperately will do or promise or say anything to get back what we think we have lost. And, and I think that's important um, ab about loss, is that it is that we think we have lost it. And... Uh, and, and we think it's so hard that, that it creates all these feelings within us. So anger, resentment, stubbornness, frustration, and, and that resentment turning toward uh, wanting to run from whatever it is that you're trying to bargain with. So if you're trying to bargain with God, and he's not listening to you, and she's not coming back, and this isn't changing, then it, that you, you want to get away. You're like, fine. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to have anything to do with you anymore. Then. At least that's kind of where it led to in me. I was tempted to say, fine, be that way. <laughs> You're not my friend anymore, <laughs> you know. And it, I was pretty young, but still, it's, it's a natural thing to feel like if somebody's responsible for this pain, then, then you don't like me if you made this happen to me. So after that, that stage of the anger and the bitterness and the resentment, then, then you can go into depression, reflection, and loneliness where you just feel lost, broken, stifled, hopeless, confused, and not caring. Just like whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and just sort of spiral down into uh, just sort of non-existent. Almost like, almost like you die yourself inside and it just shuts you down. And, and that's what depression is. It's a shutting down of the soul. It's like, I'm not going to be a soul anymore. I'll just unsoul myself. And, and of course, you can't do that. You don't have that power. And so it's just an exercise in like, trying, to, trying to, to, to stifle a thing that can't be stifled. So it's another exercise in frustration. And so you just want to sleep. You want to not talk to anybody, you want to cover your face, you want to close the door, you want it dark, you want it, you want to be away from people, and, and, and you don't want, you don't want anybody to tell you that it's going to be okay. <laughs> so, you can feel pretty heavy, and, and it can be like soul crushing, and frustrating in the extreme, in the extreme. And, and at this point, then you realize that you have a choice. You, you do have a choice. And some people never make that choice, but, but invariably, I believe that in that point, when we realize that we've shut ourselves down, and we're trying to punish God by shutting ourselves down because he took something from us, and that punishing God means destroying yourself, and that somehow that's going to make, make it all, well, at least make you feel like you got some of yours back or something. 
revenge is pretty senseless, but it doesn't feel like that when you're trying to get it. It feels like I'm getting what I deserve. I deserve to be shut down because they shut me down and they took something from me. So it's like a, it's like a way of trying to punish God or whoever you think is responsible for this. And at that point you do have a choice. And that choice is to to um, move on or not. <laughs> to say, okay, well, I can destroy my life because this person is gone, or I can live my life to the best of my ability in maybe in honor of that person. That's a that's a good a good value, but but at that point you have to find some reason to go on. A reason and a way to go on. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck, is right down there in the very bottom. And and they don't have a reason. So in that moment, the church can be very helpful. If you're church going, you can go to a meeting, and in that meeting, God will speak to you, speak to your soul, and remind you that life is eternal, that, that there is no such thing as loss. Like it says in that hymn, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And the truth is, which your soul at that closed point does not want to hear, but needs to hear, the truth is that nothing is ever lost. You cannot lose anything when you are, well, you can't. You can pretend that you have lost something. You can go through the motions. You can believe that you've lost something, but nothing is ever truly lost. Because in God's universe, all things are present now. So that person that you think you've lost is not dead. They're not gone even. And Joseph Smith taught that the spirit world is right here. So let's pretend that we're blind and a person dies. Is it any different than that I can't see them? Not really. So if I know that a person is here, or I believe that that person is here, it can be as though they are here. <coughs> now, I recognize that's kind of a fine point. And, and I, I've struggled with that myself, because when you've experienced so much loss, you start to wonder about loss, and you start to wonder Wow, why is there so much loss? Whoa. And then you wonder about God. But then, okay, now let's stand in God's shoes for just a minute and take a picture of what's happening to us. So we're down here, we think down here, and we think he's up there and he's far away somewhere. When in reality, let's take a look at it from God's position. God is right here. So yes, we can't see him, but he's here, and his reality is right with ours. And when somebody dies, they go into his reality, but they don't actually leave ours. We're all in the same reality, but we with our eyes cannot see it. Now, in the, in the book of, um, that, that talks about Elijah, I think it's in Samuel, where he tells his servant, um, uh, there are more that be with us than be with them. And he says, open his eyes. And the servant's eyes are opened and he sees a host of angels. Now, just because we don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. And, and so, how, how can I explain this? Okay, so I was... Uh, I was watching a program one day and they described two different types of cells. And these two different types of cells were, were acting together under their microscope. And they said all of a sudden one of them just disappeared. 
But what they discovered was that the cell was still there. They just couldn't see it because it had changed to a higher frequency of vibration. So a little bit like light. We can see certain vibrations of light. And certain vibrations, like ultraviolet, we can't see. But they're still here. And that's how, that's how the soul is. The soul, when it's separate from the body, is acting on a higher vibration. And so it, it rises, but not spatially, just vibrationally. So we think of it as going to a different place. But God sees it more as raising to a higher vibration. And, and so being in a realm where we, with our lower vibration eyes, don't see it. But he tells us repeatedly that he's not leaving us. That he's right here. He says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, can we believe him? Absolutely. So in that point where we have that severe moment of where we ourselves are dying because we've had loss of someone or something, that's when God comes to us and says, you have a choice. You can either believe that I am still here, that they are still here, that it is still here and you have lost nothing, or you can believe in loss, lack, pain, fear, doubt, grief, anxiety, and worry. You can believe in that, you can live it, you can feel it, and be there for as long as you desire, or you can believe in the truth that nothing is ever truly lost and that it may not be in our sight but it is still here so for instance so for instance you have a a, a book that you love you you just love this book and it's your favorite book and you read it occasionally and you keep it by your bed and one day you wake up and it's gone it's gone and you can't find it anywhere now When I've read a book that many times, I can recall almost everything that was said in it. And I can see it in my mind. And I can probably go right online and just buy it again. So just because a book has passed out of my hands and I can't find it, doesn't mean it's lost from me. It can still be brought back. And that's how our soul is, that's how our life is, that's how everything is. If you can think it, it's never truly lost. I've, I've had lots of movies that teach this principle where they say, he will live on in my memory. But it's more than that. They actually do live. And they can actually be with us. So that said, the next step is the upward turn where we look up, we trust, we believe that we're not only going to see them again, but we can actually experience them here and now. That they're never truly lost. All we have to do is think of them. Brigham Young taught this principle. He said, if you think of your loved one who has passed away, and you have a strong memory of them, he said, they will be there with you. Those strong memories are an indication that they're there, which is why we began with the, the, the sensory thing this morning. When you have a strong memory, and sometimes smells can bring up those memories of some person that may have passed away long ago, they are there with you. Now I'm gonna share a very sacred experience that I had after my grandfather passed away. I happened to be living on my farm down in Utah and was having a particularly difficult day. And I was walking through my house sobbing with my difficult day and feeling like I just didn't know if I could keep going. And as I was walking back to my bedroom to lie down on the bed and weep some more, I uh, 
I walked by a piece of paper. And as I sometimes do, I picked it up. And I picked it up and I looked at it and it was a picture of my grandfather. And I, I thought to myself, how did this picture get here? Because I honestly didn't know I had it. And if it came up into where it was at in the hallway, it had to have traveled from a box in the basement all the way up the stairs and into the hallway by some power, I don't know, one of the children perhaps, but why that picture, why that moment? It was divine intervention. Because as I picked it up and I looked at his picture, I just had this flood of memories and love of my grandfather. And I did go to my bed and I sat on the end of my bed and began to weep with the joy of the memory of my grandfather. And I felt, I literally felt his arm go around my shoulders and just stay there till I was done sobbing. And then his kind words, he said, don't you know that I'm here? Don't you know that I'm here all the time? And I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know that. But that healed something in my heart that about loss. I, I was thinking that I'd lost my grandfather when he died. But what really happened is that he became more able to be with me than he would if he had been alive. If he'd been alive, he'd been living a thousand miles away on his farm. He would not be in my living room putting his arm around me. So I was grateful in that moment that he had passed away and that he could be with me in that moment because I needed him. So the upward turn helps us feel strengthened, motivated, and awakened. So it's like we've died and we've come back to life. That is how we can use death in our life and loss. We use it as a reason to be reborn to say, well, how can I start over? And, and say, well, from now on, my new life will look like this with my person who, who it only looks like I've lost right beside me. That person is gonna walk with me through all of the rest of my days. And that is how it can be. The next step is reconstruction and working through. So yeah, there's a certain amount of rebuilding, starting over, of repositioning our life, maybe rescheduling if we were visiting that person or, or using that thing and now we've lost it. But we, we reconstruct, we rebuild, we, we take out a new sheet of paper, throw out the old ones and say, okay, let's Start a brand new clean slate here. Take out a pencil and write our new life. So in the stage of reconstruction, after you have decided that you're going to move forward and not stay trying to die, but you're gonna move forward and honor that person or that thing that you've lost. Honor them by taking everything you learned from them and pulling it forward with you. So in this stage, I recommend writing your new life. Basically taking a piece of paper and saying, from now on, my life will be dot, dot, dot. So if that person uh, left you too soon, then maybe your new agreement would be, I'm going to live every day it, to the best of my ability, making the most of every moment with the people I love. That's a great agreement to have because you don't know when a, a person might be removed from your life, whether by moving away or passing away or whatever it is. Life changes, it's always changing. That's the only constant they say. But with this new change, you can just write your new life and 
put in all the from now ons that you want. All the guilt you felt in the first stages, make a new agreement about your new life and let it be a new birth. And say, I am a new person. That old person is gone with that old thing and now the new person is the person who does it this way. The atonement of Jesus allows us that power. The power to forgive ourselves from whatever in the past was there and start over. <coughs> I love funerals. Funerals are some of the best meetings because they help us who are still here to take an assessment of our lives and say, how can I be better? Like Everybody is testifying, this person did this and this and this and this, and you're like, wow, they were really amazing. I want to be like that from now on. So I went to a funeral, and it's, it was my favorite funeral. I've been to dozens of funerals, because my husband and I do funerals a lot, because he plays the organ and I lead the music. So um, at this one funeral, at, which I will never forget, they told the story of the lady who had passed away. She was in a rest home, and she uh, was not doing so well, as, as they sometimes are, and uh, uh, one morning the attendants walked into her room and found her lying on the floor, and they were like, oh my gosh, she's, she's passed away. And they called paramedics and got everybody in there and started to take care of her. And all of a sudden she sat up and she screamed, April Fools! <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, to be in that situation where you never know if the next gonna be, day is gonna be your last, and then to still have the sense of humor to play a joke on your attendants and say, April Fools, I'm not dead. I laughed and laughed at that. I just thought it was so sweet that her family would tell that story about her. And I thought to myself, I want to be that kind of person. And it was like one of the most uplifting moments of my life to realize that even as they were, you know, going through the, the death of this person, they were enlivened by her life. So we needn't focus only on the fact that they've been taken from our sight, which is really all that it is, but focus on what they've taught us, which is why in the church we're counseled to go to funerals. They don't really talk about it much anymore, but it used to be a big deal that the whole ward was supposed to go to all the funerals oh. from the ward. So anyway, that's, that's my two cents. Go to the funeral, because they're awesome. Okay, and that gives us the next step wherein we find acceptance and hope. We not only reconstruct our life and move forward, but we are grateful and hopeful of the future. We accept that this has happened and we're okay with it. We are okay. We are okay, and we're okay with them being where they are. Now, in the church, we often talk about people who go to the other side uh, on a mission, and, and they fulfill missionary work for people who have passed away. And that's a very real thing. Now, if somebody goes on a mission here, we can't see them, and, but we don't, we don't mourn their passing just because they've gone on a mission. We still write them letters, and we still call them. And I submit that we can still do the same here. We can write letters to people who have passed away, and they will read them. Because God knows everything. And he knows when we're writing a letter to somebody. He knows when we're writing a letter to him. So in the most recent episode of The Chosen, which just came out, um, season two, um, there is a, a scene in there where this man, uh, Nathaniel, is under the fig tree. Now we know that story, but under the fig tree he is burning his plans. 
his architectural plans that he had designed to build a beautiful thing for God. And he burns them because he is grieving the loss of his faith, of his hope, of his job, of his livelihood, and he wants God to stop him. He wants God to rescue him in that moment. But it's not until the next day and Jesus finds him and he says, I was there. I saw you under the fig tree. You want to build something for God. Can you start tomorrow? <sighs> and it, it just, it just, it blew me away because I saw myself under that tree burning my plans and wondering if God was going to stop me and save me and deliver me and come to me and say it's going to be okay. But instead, he waited until I watched that video and he said, you want to build something for God? And I said, yes. And I will start. I'll start today. Acceptance and hope. We can accept what has happened. Allow it and trust that God knows what he's doing. When somebody passes from here to there, they are going to God. And God, it's not death for him. It's like, whoa, you're back. I'm so glad. <laughs> so think of it from God's perspective. We only see it from here, and we think of death as the ultimate evil. But it isn't. Death is an illusion, an illusion that we're playing out in this sphere because we have sight. If we can't see somebody, it's dead. Babies are that way. If a baby can't see something, they think it's gone. They don't, they don't understand that. It takes them a few months to recognize that maybe you're behind it. But that's God teaching us that maybe he's behind something that you can't see. That's hope and acceptance. I love the scripture, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Have you ever thought that those are commandments? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's you that lets your heart be troubled. It's you that lets it be afraid. So if you don't let it and you say, no, I will not doubt, I will not fear, then you have said no to death and, said, and have said, like Jesus did, death does not exist for me. What's death but an illusion? Watch me. See, I'm dead. See, I'm alive. See, I'm dead. See, I'm alive. It's an illusion. And so he, that's the peace he gives us. The peace of knowing that death, loss, fear, doubt, worry, frustration, anger, all of that is an illusion that we create because of Eve partaking of the fruit <laughs> in the beginning, which is why we're brought back to that in the temple, to remind us that in the beginning, she believed the lie, and that's where it began. But we can unbelieve that lie and believe the truth and find the peace that God gives us as we say no to doubt and fear. I will not doubt. I will not fear. I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not. And as we do that, then we can get through even the most terrible losses in our life, which ultimately will not be terrible. They'll be good. So as you work through those steps, one isn't good and the other bad. They just, 
they're just steps that the natural man has to go through in order to get back to God because we all fall at some point and grief is a pretty big way to fall because it's believing in loss and we all do it and and so grief is an opportunity for us to learn how to believe in the concept of that there is no loss and there is no death because death is swallowed up in victory through the resurrection of Christ. So now I've got a few affirmations and they're not for grief and loss, they're for acceptance and presence because we're not going to affirm grief, we're going to affirm acceptance. But that's, that is the why. So I allow myself to feel this fully to be here. I just feel it. That's, that's the first allowing that can happen. I allow myself to feel this fully. It's like, yeah, that happened. So it, you, you don't have to say, well, it didn't happen. No, it, it happened. And, and weep the tears of, of loss that the, that the body has to do to release. And then I let go of my resistance to this situation. The natural man wants to resist it. He wants to fight it. He wants to deny it. He wants to stop it. But God says, allow it and weep and don't resist it. Just accept it. Then I'll never be the same person again. Yet, that is okay. I am surrounded by support, seen and unseen. So many times when I would go to the funeral of a person who we were doing the music for, I would be standing at the podium doing the music and I would see that person just come and stand beside me and hear their voice in my mind so many times. And I knew they weren't dead because I was hearing their voice right there. And they were telling me things. It, it, it's a wonderful thing. I choose to heal my hurt spirit. I choose to heal my hurt spirit. I am not going to hold back. I can still see love in the world. Yes, I can. I am moving through grief and on to other emotions. I can hold on to the love and let go of the grief. The universe lifts me, supports me, guides me. I can accept help when it is offered. Today I choose to heal. I can pay tribute by living my own life in a beautiful way. I am so grateful our paths crossed. I am gentle with myself as I heal. I focus on my blessings, goals, and memories. So I want to thank you all for coming today to our lesson about acceptance <laughs> and, and seeing perhaps what is there but our natural eyes cannot see and finding the peace of God even through grief and apparent loss. So have a great day. I love you all. <laughs>